what better way to bring in the new year and a new season of Let's Talk About than with Harvester. Checklist time. Edgy? Check. Off the wall? Check. Audacious in both subject matter and presentation? Check and check. Weirdly sexual in an off-putting but legal way? More on that later, but in the context of the game check, yeah, I guess that means it fits my show perfectly. Harvester isn't exactly a game that needs an introduction, seeing as it usually gets dragged around in front of the internet crowd to have its gruesome corpse paraded like a preserved pariah every few years. Joel and Retsupre come to mind as both have done full playthroughs of it, but for the uninitiated, well, you'll see with your own eyes how hard Harvester comes at its audience. There are two people important to the tale of Harvester, producer Lee Jacobson and lead developer slash writer Gilbert Austin, the two heads of Harvester's creation. On the creative side of things, Harvester is the baby of Gilbert Austin, whose process for coming up with the title is detailed in an interview conducted by a fan and posted on Good Old Games. When asked how he came up with the macabre piece of entertainment, Gilbert stated that a friend of mine who wrote music at Origin, Donna Glover, contacted me and told me that Lee Jacobson at Future Vision was looking around for someone established to create games for them on a contract basis. I had worked on Wing Commander 2, Strike Commander, and Privateer as a writer and as a storyboard artist, designer, and production supervisor for the cinematics, so I was pretty much the kind of guy they were looking for. I agreed that I'd talk to them, and so I was invited to come in and pitch any ideas I wanted. Future Vision, as I will refer to them from now on as DigiFX is the same company, was an extremely small developer at the time, barely off the ground with releases such as Command Adventures Starship and The Fortress of Dr. Radiac, which looks suspiciously like Island Peril, or actually the other way around as Doctor came out first, so expect Civi to cover it in a month or two. Gotta love old shoddy F FPSs that try to ape off of Wolfenstein and Doom. Recognizing that future was in dire straits, Gilbert thought that the company would need something high concept to compete with the industry giants of the time and had argued that Harvester was exactly that idea. It was really the only idea that I pitched. I remember that it came to me in a flash. That's how I get a lot of my ideas, in creative rushes where I can barely write fast enough to get it all down. In short, an auteur work that challenged its audience was what Gilbert was aiming for, and to his credit, Future and Lee gave him the full reins. As Gilbert says in the interview, I had complete creative control and could do whatever I wanted, with the exception of explicit said sex and nudity, sadly, but even so, I think I managed to get some pretty fucked up stuff in there just the same. This was amidst the Joe Lieberman crusade, providing Gilbert the perfect springboard for his story's message, anti-censorship and the hypocrisy of American society. Going back to Gilbert, anyone who censors anything is a piece of shit in my book, and I said as much. I still do. That tired argument about children is the first refuge of the dictator. Oh, we have to protect our children from harm harmful influences. A kid might stumble across this, so we'd better ban it. Fascism in my book, you can't childproof the fucking world. Not everything can or should be appropriate for kids. That's what parents are for, to filter that shit. The government shouldn't be doing it, and certainly artists shouldn't be doing it. Harvester wasn't the only game of its type, however, as also being shown off at the 1994 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas was Phantasmagoria. Sierra's bloody point-and-click adventure was beaten out by a little indie project, a break that future needed, a break that would never come. Originally scheduled for a 1994 release, Harvester would miss it by two years, finally seeing the light of day in 1996. Despite work beginning on Harvester first, Dr. Randiac, which Gilbert also wrote for, came out first. As soon as all creative work was finished for Harvester, including a grueling summer filming for the game, Gilbert up and left future, only surfacing later as an actor for a local broadcast show in Texas by the name of Professor Griffin's Midnight Shadow Show. He was finished for the project, leaving the rest of the workload of Harvester to Lee Jacobson. The reason for the holdup, as Lee explains in another GOG interview, was that unfortunately from the technology side and the resources we had at the time, which I still believe happens today, really set us back in our production schedule longer than we had anticipated. It's always a challenge to push the envelope, and unfortunately in doing so, you can always anticipate all the challenges the production team will face. 
I have no doubt that game delays will be a part of the industry or as long as it exists. The original CES trailer showcased that the game would be going for a comic book style, but as already mentioned, Gilbert and Lee oversaw a three month shoot as Harvester switched over to using digitized actors on green screens a la Mortal Kombat and focused heavily on 3D. Perhaps this choice, coupled with Future's relative greenness, Gilbert's over ambition, and Lee's poor handling of budget, killed the momentum that Harvester had. Two years in game industry speak is quite a bit of time, as while Harvester was facing programming issues, Phantasmagoria upstaged the work in progress by releasing on time in 1995. With that cat out of the bag, Harvester seemed quaint, especially since according to Genesis Temple that many of the interviews, especially those approaching the 1996 release date, banked on people being offended by the content. I fully expect to see protests. We won't limp out on anything, said Lee Jacobson on an interview. Naturally, nothing much happened since very few people played the game, surely not enough to cause such a ruckus. Perhaps they missed on their chances to organize some fake protests as a PR stunt. That might have also been because of the problems Future Vision had with shops not wanting to carry the game, but in the end, it made little difference. While critics more or less were appreciative of the efforts, with PC gamers saying this is no lightweight phantasmagoria wannabe, it's an unrelenting assault on your sensibilities from start to finish, the public seemed to mostly ignore it. Germany did ban the game because they are as consistent as Australia among other admonishments, but Harvester didn't capture any attention unlike its contemporaries. While Future Vision would continue to chug along, the death of Merit Studios among other issues pulled the company under. From Lee in a PC Gamer interview, it is extremely unfortunate that after six years we are forced to shut down because other companies can't pay their bills. Said Lee Jacobson, DigiFX's director of production, it's hard enough to develop projects with developers receiving such razor-thin margins, but when you compound it with not being paid, it can hurt you in a hurry. Constant product slippage also contributed to DigiFX's demise. We had serious problems with the programmer's ability to keep to the development schedule, said Jacobson. It seemed as if there was no end to the project's mission to Nexus Prime life cycle. Harvester as we know it fell into the well of time before being pulled up by Curiosity where it now sits as a cult classic with 2014 releases on GOG by Jacobson and Steam by Night Dive, the version I played. Of course, who knows what would have happened if it did release on time as like the fluttering of a monarch's wings, history may have happened differently. Oh yeah. That. The main actor of the game, Kurt Stefan Kistler, is a registered sex offender. Three guesses as to what he did, as Steve was always such a kidder. Our tale opens up with a long introductory cutscene before we get plopped down into the room of Steve Mason. And Steve, as we will find out in about two seconds, has a serious case of Kidder Syndrome and amnesia. Born and raised in the town of Harvest, population 50 and soon to drop, Steve has no recollection of anything though his mom, kid brother, and literally everyone else in the town seems to brush it off by calling his bluff. Steve, are you talking to me? Yeah, only I don't want to be, because I'm trying to watch my cowboy show. I'm sorry. Look, I'm telling you, I need your help. I've lost my memory. Have not. Cut it out. I'm telling you the truth. You always were, Kidder Steve. Leave me alone. I'm sick. Land's sake, stop your joshing, won't you? Honestly, Steve, I thought you'd grow up a little after graduation. I only hope that new job will plant your feet on the ground. So that's my name. Steve. Your name will be M.U.D. Mud if you don't stop teasing me, young man. Listen, this may sound strange, but I've lost my memory. Do you believe me? Well, you always were a kidder, Steve. Most people ask me why I don't remember their names. Well, you always were a kidder, Steve. Besides, as one who deals with the dead, I try not to involve myself in the affairs of the living. Hello, Steve. Let me introduce myself. I'm Sheriff Dwayne Dwayne, and this here is Loomis. Pleasure, I reckon. Then, we haven't met before? Of course we have, but I heard about your alleged amnesia and figured I'd play along. I sure hope this is just a prank. 
and not the start of some insanity plea. Keep your nose clean, or you'll wind up in jail, and that's no place to hold a wedding. All except Stephanie Potsdam, who seems to be suffering the same bout of forgotten memory. These two, by the way, are scheduled to get married despite not actually knowing each other. As Steve gets accustomed to the bizarre 1950s set that is Harvest, basically everyone he meets tells him to join the Lodge, the Hall of the Order of the Harvest Moon. You know very well I'm Mr. Harold, the principal of Gain Memorial. Steve, I've heard about this amnesia nonsense. I had hoped you'd be in the Lodge by now fine young fella like yourself but now i think maybe you need a little more quality time this lodge what do you know about it the building itself like harvest was constructed with a specific purpose in mind that noble intent is known only to those within the order you're at about the right age to join them stephen and you will do so if you care about your future Initiates may enter the Hall of the Order of the Harvest Moon. Did you... say something? I did not speak, but my mind touched yours. Telepathy? But how? Only those who seek enlightenment warrant my attention. Do you hunger for true knowledge? Acting as a governmental body, the Lodge sees all of Knows all. Notably because it has its hands in everything, from the school PTA to Harvest Police Department, and even the cemetery and morgue. Ominous to say the least, but it's Steve's best bet to get out of this crazy town. Too bad Postmaster Boyle is stingy with applications, forcing Steve to get creative. Blackmailing Boyle, Steve begins his initiation into the lodge, starting off with harmlessly scratching old man Johnson's tucker, but it quickly jumps from there. Some rotten sub bitch scratched my car! My tucker, my baby, my poor darling, my sweet cheeks! If I find out who did it, I'll kill him, just kill him dead! I told that fool sheriff to beef up the patrols, but what does he care about? Nobody cares about a limp dick fat boy, well I'll make them care! I'll make them care! Did you hear that Karen disappeared? Just goes to show you what can happen without a man's stewardship in the house. It takes both a man and a woman to raise a child properly. It says so in the Bible. But try to convince Edna of that? Oh no. And now she's lost everything. Hmm. This might be a good time to drop in. While she's feeling vulnerable. Bye now. While he was finding a way to accomplish the goal, Steve sees Mr. Potsdam, his soon-to-be father-in-law, burying something in the cemetery. Following the Tucker ordeal, Steve has to steal a bolt of cloth from the fireman, requiring him to get meat from his banged-up dad who has a CBT addiction. Steve, is that you? Come to see your poor old dad? Are you my father? Really? I don't remember you. Please. I'm not in the mood for jokes. I'm serious. Why won't anyone believe me? Well, you always were a kidder, Steve. Just don't make me laugh now. Remember the stitches. My God. What has she done to you? She doesn't know you're here, does she? Does she? No, I had to break in. What the hell is going on in here? I know it's a mystery to you. The sacred things that husbands and wives do behind closed doors. Maybe we should have that special father-son talk. Especially now that you're getting... married. <laughs> then listen. I can't talk very loud. It's the tracheotomy. When a man and a woman love each other very much, they go into a room alone and shut the door and bolt it with at least three locks and prop a chair under the doorknob so no one can get in or out. Then they take off their clothes and get out 
a wide variety of scalpels. Some curved, some short, all of them sharp. And then the man climbs on the woman. And then they... With the barbed wire, they... That's all right. Don't get worked up. You need your rest. Yes. Rest. But why did you come? You must have had a reason. For risking it. I need some meat. And Pat won't give me any without your signed permission. Good old dependable Pat. Here, son. Here's my signature. Take it to him, and you won't have any problem. Now go, son. Go quickly. Before she comes back. Just remember, this could be you, he of the inner circle. With a possible running joke established, Steve also saves Karen, Edna's daughter, to the annoyance of Mr. Potstem, and inadvertently gets the fireman's model killed. Day 4 has Steve steal Mr. Pastorelli's barber lamp, though he does steer off the path for some hanky-panky with Stephanie. Steve, it's so good to see you again. I get so lonely in here. I'm sorry. Want to hear what's happening out in the real world? No. I'd rather forget about Harvest for a while. Come here. Stephanie? I feel so close to you, Steve. Like we're the only two people in Harvest. The only two real people. Do you know what I mean? I need to feel something again. This sense I have that I've known you. It's my only link to my past. Yeah. Maybe it's different than memory. Maybe we don't remember each other so much as we recall the feelings deep inside. Strong feelings. Maybe the body has its own memory. Let's find out. I want you. Make love to me. Then take me. Now. Like before, he also winds up accidentally killing Pastorelli, leading to day 5. While the PTA bake sale is today, Boyle, the arsonist that he is, torches the TV station, providing perfect cover for Steve to do the same to Edna's diner. Having lost her only business and being a single mother with no way to raise her kid, Edna figures it'd be better for the two to hang. I've tried so hard to find an excuse to keep on fighting, but Karen and I can't go on alone any longer. This diner he left us was all we had. It was always a struggle to keep it running in such a small town. And now we've lost it. I know that I can't afford to support us now. There's only one way out. I'm sure you won't be able to understand the depth of despair that would enable a mother to put a rope around her baby's neck and push her into the air and jump after her. I wonder if I'll hear her next now. If she kicks around and takes a long time to strangle me, I'll scream, but I won't cut her down. 
I've got to be stronger than I ever was before. But I hope she doesn't care. God help us and forgive us, Edna Fitzpatrick. On this last day, Steve can finally enter the lodge, provided he has the invitation. Stephanie's spinal column. Finding her missing in her room with only a card pointing him the right direction, Steve goes to the Potsdam's mausoleum to grab the Mortal Kombat prop. You'll see once the sheriff gets here. <sighs> Stephanie, Stephanie. Things will never be the same now. Guess I'll be watching TV nights. Okay, you can come in now, son. My God. Is that what I think it is? Yep, it's a spinal cord. Is it Stephanie? I can see a resemblance, but I can't be sure. More pie, Sheriff? Pie? Don't you realize what's happened? Oh, indeed I do. I, I can just hear the tongues wagging at the PTA. W was it suicide? Never heard of anyone pulling their own spinal cord out before. Off the record, I'd have to say no. No, all in all, I'd say this was death by natural causes. Natural causes? You can't live without a spinal cord, son. Nothing unnatural about that. Think I will have some more pie. Right away. I can't believe this. This is horrible. Believe me, you get to the point to where this is routine. Now, the only clue we got is that card on our pillow. Take a look at it. This is practically a confession. Confession to what, son? Murder. Isn't that what you're here to investigate? Son, you don't investigate natural deaths. No point. Then I'll get to the bottom of this myself. Yeah, I'm sure you will. More pie, Sheriff? Don't mind if I do. In the lodge proper, Steve comes face to face with the many mysteries of life before finding Stephanie and the Sergeant at Arms in the Chapel of Love. This town was a giant simulation for a group called the Harvesters, an organization of serial killers looking to bolster their ranks. Given two options, Steve can either stay in Harvest and live a lifetime with Stephanie as their life support is cut off in the real world, or he can exit the virtual world and become a Harvester by killing her. Since Harvest is kinda based on the person's mind, meaning Steve is one violent motherfucker, he sub-zeroes Stephanie before being let out into the real world. Our story ends with some cannibalism and a joke about fictional violence with an added dash of fourth wall breaking as Steve in his mother's basement is playing Harvester. Somewhere deep below the insane antics is a critique laid against late 90s moralization surrounding video games and violence as a whole. I preface somewhere as you can see this shit. In between the blunt metaphors regarding the zero-sum game known as life and the usage of Americana as a message 
explaining that America as a concept tossed out into the ether was built on bloody conflict is batshit lunacy that can take away from the message at times. Mostly not in the this is so abhorrent that it detracts from the point, but more so that it's so ridiculous that I have a hard time taking it seriously. Steve in the Harvester ending is the one claiming that violent media doesn't make people violent, which is a truth, but he's a serial killer thus making the point hypocritical. Nowhere. Nowhere at all. What are you doing, Sam? Playing Harvester. That thing? I looked at it the other day. The very thought. Breeding serial killers. It's disgusting. It's cool. You'll rot your mind playing games like that. Don't you know people who watch violence become violent themselves? That's bullshit, Mom. No, it isn't. Why do you think they started cutting the violence out of those Roadrunner cartoons? Roadrunner cartoon. <laughs> Roadrunner cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, that may have been the point to defang video game violence as nothing more than fiction. I swatted at the children in the mystery of motherhood not because I revel in the bloodshed of innocence, but because they're enemies blocking my path. Taking the set dressing away, that's every enemy in the game and only those high up on their horse would sweat the finer details. It's from this point that I think Harvester gets away with a lot of what it does. Tongue in cheek is honestly the best way to describe Harvester's story as from the word go the game aims to be over the top. In that case, Harvester can be unsettling with its clashing of American values with uncensored violence. Take the scene where Steve's mother pops her daughter's eyes back into place. It's addressing parental oversight and what a parent thinks is best for their child even if it is harmful to them. Now that the big sale's over I just don't know how I'll fill my time. Oh I feel so Useless. My goodness. What's wrong with her? My goodness. God. Oh, it's not as bad as it looks. You just pop them back in. See? As good as new, that tarantula she ate must have had wasp eggs in it. Don't you think we should get her to a doctor? What for? She's got her mother. How silly I was, feeling useless just because there are no more cookies to bake. I can still rear my brood. This is a sign, Steve. I have a purpose again. <sighs> Glad to see you're feeling better. Mother knows best, right? So let me jam your eyeballs back in. Coincidentally, the mystery of motherhood tackles the opposite end of that angle, declaring that the sanctity of child rearing is a sham we only tell ourselves because it's been ingrained into us through traditional values. Also, both those scenes get to me in the gore sense, but that's neither here nor there. At the center, Harvester is standing in the center, making fun of both extremes. To declare children as parasites or that parents always know best is a fallacy only those lost in their bubbles would assert. I mean, Gein Memorial, named after real-life Leverface Ed Gein, pokes a lot of fun at the educational system, highlighting that even teachers aren't immune to being ignorant, underhanded, or creeps. If an A-bomb hits, what good is it going to do to duck and cover?
Duck and cover for those not in the know when it comes to Cold War lingo or the Iron Giant was an exercise told to kids of the era as a preventative measure in the case an atomic bomb was launched. Those with brain cells will instantly realize that, yeah, if a nuke is sent your way, you're fucked. But instead of telling kids that, it was much easier to dance around the subject or play pretend. While kids shouldn't stare down all the atrocities of the world, if there is a direct correlation to their life, pussyfooting around will only exacerbate them. Using the Iron Giant, Hogarth doesn't shy away from telling the eponymous figure that the deer is dead. That's a natural part of life, so to hide that away is damaging to developing minds. Likewise, kids are kids. They don't know better and should be kept away from sources that mean to do them harm. Remember Elsagate? That's the modern example for why keeping an eye on your kids is a duty you must apply hold as a parent, or if you want a more direct reference, Joe Lieberman and the ESRB. There's even a little bit of art criticism in Harvester with the firemen and the town's reaction to them. There is an uncomfortableness to be addressed as Harvester goes all out and not pulling punches, though it reflects at the time how many people viewed LGBTQ with disdain. The firemen do nothing really wrong except preoccupy their time with art, which seems to me more about how some artists get so engulfed in their craft that they forget about the real world. But for all I have said about this story, you don't have to interact with this side at all. Harvester works as its own standalone piece without these readings. You can let the insanity take you on this somewhat enjoyable ride through 1950s middle America, doubly so since the oddball cast of characters have charm in their own rights. You don't forget the wasp woman going into specifics to the point that she describes the sting of a wasp as akin to ejaculation or Mr. Johnson talking about Johnson. Moment to moment story beats go off the rails fast, what with Deputy Dwayne Dwayne sharing screen time in the two most darkly hilarious scenes of the game, the hanging of Edna and Karen, and the discovery of Stephanie's spinal cord. Edna Fitzpatrick is one of the snootiest women in town. I declare there isn't a woman in Harvest that turned me away. If I was interested, that is. Just because she owns DNAs, she's got all these highfalutin ideas about independence. And her with a little girl to raise. That child needs a father. And Edna, well, she needs a good, hard penis. What makes you so sure she needs a penis? You saying Edna's getting it from someone else? Like maybe that damn Sheriff Dwayne Dwayne? He's over at DNA's diner every day from noon to one, eating his dad gum pie. And I got a feeling he'd like Edna for dessert. Sure, it's the only diner in town, but I'm sure he's got more on his mind than food. Chewing the scenery doesn't even begin to describe it, or how about the two sex scenes that Steve can initiate, full of awkward tension that is palpable from beyond the fourth wall. There's no end to the entertainment that Harvester's story can provide, so while there is messaging within the plot that can be considered deep if you want to use that descriptor, the sheer bewilderment that each new bit brings is well worth the admission into Harvester's population. <laughs> If I was a professional, I would dare say that this game looks bad. The inclusion of full 3D environments with green screens make Harvester reek with age, dating it to the mid-90s. Even out of the FMV craze that swept through gaming, it is shocking how bad Harvester looks at times. Compared to the likes of Mortal Kombat, Seventh Guest, or even Realms of the Haunting, Harvester does not hold a candle. The mundane elements are easily beaten out by other FMV games that were equally as such, while the fantastical gets blown out of the water. Do I have to bring up Ripper? But I'm not a professional, so Harvester, in my eyes, looks quite good for what it is going for. The game aims to shock and unnerve you, which is exactly what the digitization and strange setting does. The prevailing feeling that something is off can be made apparent within the first few moments of gameplay, with the inclusion of the familiar 1950s setting only adding to the otherness the world permeates. There is a disconnect you can feel just by looking at the game, heightening the tone that Harvester is aiming to hit. Oh! Huh? What? Screwing in the school broom closet? What will people think? Are you blackmailing us, you little shit? 
Calm down, Mr. Harrell. Stephen would never do that. He's a smiley bear. But we should give him a token of our appreciation for his silence. Here, Stephen, take this baseball bat. You'll find it quite useful. That a boy. Take the bat, and we'll take the photo. However will I keep the children in line now? I have a spare I can bring in tomorrow, unless you'd prefer a chainsaw this time. I'll talk to Mrs. Phelps. You're in the belly of the beast way before you enter the lodge and see the more zany elements, though I do think these parts don't match up to the town. Sure, they're more vivid, but the feeling of unbelonging just evaporates when you see that literal monsters are trying to kill you. Harvest feels like infiltrating the children of the corn, knowing that all the eyes are on you. Granted, for as much as I can big up the set, a lot of the presentation is held up by the performances. Again, if I was snooty, I would make the argument that they aren't good. Line delivery is wooden across the board, and a lot of the more emotional scenes are delivered flatter than Fairy Knight Lancelot. We're talking about being on the level of Netflix's Cowboy Bebop, only because I need to fulfill my mainstream quota for the day. But unlike that shitstorm, what Harvester has is genuine charm. There's an earnestness to the acting that makes it hard to criticize. It's akin to Pink Flamingos, where if this script was performed by well-trained actors, it would lose a lot of of its luster. Yes, a great deal of pleasure. The wasp is a sensual being, not a laborer. Hedonistic instead of industrial. Some think them quick to anger. In truth, they are easily swayed to ecstasy. They penetrate your flesh, and the muscular contractions in their thorax as they pump venom could be likened to the muscular contractions of ejaculation. Each painful welt, an act of love. While I will acknowledge that is a backhanded compliment in the regard that I basically said that these aren't great performers, they were the best choice to act out Gilbert's writing. Despite the ironic elements of the story using American traditionalism as a take that to the moralization on violence, there's no moment where the acting is in on the joke, a huge positive in my book, as a lot of comedy or wacky parts of stories nowadays always feel the urge to separate itself from what is going on with detached eyes. Irony. Harvester is not too cool for its own britches. What you see is what you get, including pie. What does negatively impact the presentation, however, is the music. On the whole, it's not too intrusive or memorable, but the general audio stuttering is what makes the soundtrack annoying. This glitch only applies to the music, where it will play back certain parts of a track in a weird mini loop. Don't know what causes this, but it can be aggravating with some tracks like the Potsdam Residence main theme. Harvester is a graphic point-and-click FMV adventure game with a swerve into combat. Controls are simple, really, as the game is only played with two buttons. Left mouse click is your interact and move key, while right is your attack key. Booting the game up and getting past all the introductions sees you start out in Steve's room, the perfect place to learn how to move around in the world. While you can point to where you want Steve to go and click to get him there, most of the time you'll be looking for exit signs. Whenever you mouse over a transition, your cursor will change from either the Harvester logo or an image of Steve walking to an exit sign. Barring some obstacles blocking Steve's pathfinding, whenever one of these is clicked on, Steve will move to the next screen or exit whatever location he is in. Of course, sometimes the cursor will change to a magnifying glass to examine an object or a hand to pick it up, though some items do pop immediately into Steve's inventory, such as when you are doing a close examination of an area, most of the time you'll have to drop the object into Steve's Steve's inventory by clicking on him. Doing so without a held item will allow you to peruse Steve's inventory where you can combine certain puzzle elements, arm Steve with a weapon, check his health or use healing items, or grab an item needed to be used on an object outside the inventory. Unlike other point and clicks, there's no moon logic here as many of the puzzles require simple deduction or real life reasoning. A manhole opener is stuck and won't turn, use some petroleum jelly to grease it up, need an application 
Revelation blackmail the Postmaster, in between problem solving are the many chats Steve will find himself in, though day one, as the game is spliced up into six days, is the heaviest with the dialogue as you kinda have to talk to everyone to get the lay of the land, most are fluff and Harvester almost always points you in the right direction to who you need to talk to. Mainly the Sergeant at Arms is in the town part of Harvester you need to fulfill his tasks to get into the lodge. An average day in Harvester goes as such. Talk with the residents of Harvest for flavor text, heed the Sergeant for your next task, which almost always causes day to turn to night, carry out the task in whatever method the game has provided you with, return home to repeat the cycle. This does change in the lodge portion of the game where combat takes over. For the briefest breakdown on belligerence, you go into your inventory, select a weapon with right click, then mash it to hopefully kill your attacker before they do you. Healing and Harvester is rare, so try to win fights with minuscule damage. Weapons are split into two categories, melee and ranged. There is a wide variety from shovels and scythes to nail guns and shotguns, guns, but all that changes between them is damage and for melee range. Guns are the most optimal tool to use, but they run on ammo that is scarce. Enemies in Harvester are a wild bunch in theory, but like you, the only difference between them is if they have a ranged attack or not. Trust me, those that can hit you from a distance are the more threatening of the two. This section might as well be a highlight reel for all the weird shit that happens in Harvester because, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. First off, an underrated aspect of the game is that the town does catch wind of your deeds. After each crime you commit, you can talk to each townie to hear their thoughts on the matter. Take Mr. Johnson, for example. After scratching his tucker, he has a typical reaction to the act displaying that these characters, while background props that need to be moved around, do react to the world around them. Them. When Karen gets kidnapped, Johnson, like Hank, tries to manipulate Edna for his own ill will as per his words, she's vulnerable. Rescuing her daughter has Johnson give out to Steve for ruining his plan. All the townsfolk of Harvest are like this, making the tiny population seem more than static entities. Perhaps the best aspect of Harvester is that a number of the puzzles have different solutions. With getting the Lodge application, you can either use the button found in the dirt pile that was once the local newspaper or find the bribe at the police station. Either are the right choice, but if you go the extra step when warding off Loomis and collect the checkbook, you can get a free pass from Dwayne. While some characters are vital and will give you a game over if you kill them regardless if you have the get out of jail card, this doesn't apply to all of them. Don't like having to deal with Jimmy? You can kill him as long as you have the card. He even drops his gun for... Well, the only thing you fight in the town is the Crypt Wolf, but it is there if you want it. Not up to sneaking into Johnson's garage to damage his car, just do it right in front of him. Sure, you have to fight Johnson if this is the path you take, but it is the quickest route. Tiny details like this are abundant in Harvester. There is an option in dialogue to write in a response with hidden conversations only found by this option. Typing in fuck or dominatrix to Steve's mother elicits two different conversations while saying peephole or molest has a effects on Mr. Potsdam. Going even further than that, inventory items can arouse the same reactions. Acquiring the meat is needed for progress to steal the bolt, but there is nothing stopping you from teasing Mr. Potsdam with it. This is also how you get the more unique game overs. Visiting dear old dad at nighttime ends up seeing Steve blasted all over the wall by his shotgun toting mother. Then there's the whole conversation tree with Buster Monroe. In three separate instances, you can cause the end of the world because you didn't pass off as an American. The lodge itself, while I will get to later as it is lacking, has divergent paths depending on what you find. Grabbing the Cat of Nine Tails allows you to kill Mr. Kane with ease for the library side quest and defeating the chess master via chess is entirely optional. You can just duel with the chess master for his key then shoot straight for the third floor. Finding the mirror for the temple of beauty is an alternative solution as you can just start blasting like Frank Reynolds. You miss out on the beauty tearing her face off if you do which doesn't lead to you fighting her. Wrapping around the whole of Harvester some truly bizarre scenarios and conversations. I've already brought up the wasp lady and Dwayne's contributions to the plot, but that's only the surface. What about bribing Loomis with porno leading to him getting caught jacking it in San Diego? Why does he howl like a dog and why does the line, Loomis, damn you, carry so much visceral energy?
Hello, Steve. Where's Loomis? Yeah, but come around. I'm out. Let's just go. Oh, oh, that's good. <gasps> Loomis, damn you! <laughs> Wait, no, 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 you no! Uh, no! Cleaning up the mattress uh, again. Folding no. up the towels. No, I ain't trying to snipe out. The PTA ladies are all pod people while the principal of the school is a bit too handsy with his quality time. Spare the rod, but a baseball bat is just fine. There is an extended conversation about aliens creeping into Harvester from Clem that gets carried over to Colonel Monroe. Monroe as a character has the least amount of impact in the plot, as you never have to visit him, but his game over might take the cake for Harvester. Aside from your commie bastard, your alien from another planet is the greatest threat to our democratic way of life. Did you know that 90% of sightings occur within the area of military installations? Hell, I shoot at them whenever I see their ships fly over, but my bullets ping harmlessly off of their hulls. I suspect those things operate out of the lodge. Just try to convince anyone in Harvest of that. I tell you, son, a nuclear holocaust would be preferable to a takeover by big-headed aliens from Pluto. Lucky for us, I'll be making that call when the time comes. I wanted to get back into the thick of the action and out of this desk job. Those firemen are a damn peculiar bunch of ladies. I thought they'd object to my lack of a lower body, but they wouldn't let me join the fire department because they said I couldn't draw naked men. Can't draw naked men? Who the hell wants to? I could draw one if I was a sick commie pervert. Look, I did this last night, what do you think? You don't say. Then you'd better go reconnoiter the fire station, mister. There's a lot of art going on over there. Determine if commie infiltration has occurred in Harvest, and report back here. Your report could make the difference in what I decide to do. When facing off against Mr. Potsdam in the lodge, he has painted on pants. Originally, he was just in his underwear, but this addition, while probably connected to something with the game's rating, is hilarious. During the transition between days, there's a little nightmare sequence that Steve experiences that is the exact same every time. While most of it is horrific imagery, why does a burger fly in out of nowhere? This isn't even half of the insanity as letting Steve stay in harvest until the blood drive leads to a Another game over. All in all, the weirdness infecting Harvest is the main selling point. For as good as Harvester is in the first half, the second half, the Lodge is where the game trips and stumbles. Replacing logic puzzles and quirky characters is a barrage of combat scenarios that hurt the overall experience. For starters, slap fighting is the main martial art practiced in Harvest, and one you will grow tired of. Broken down in gameplay, the entirety of combat is equipping a weapon and praying to any gods listening that you can outdamage your opponent. There's no in-depth strategy besides right-clicking like a motherfucker in the vain attempt to stunlock whoever you are fighting. What really grinds my gears though is how unfair engaging with enemies can be. Most of the fanfare are melee, but the few that have guns highlight how brain dead this system is. If you don't have either the shotgun or nail gun trained on a ranged foe, you're dead. They fire so fast that Steve is helpless to stunlock, which brings in another issue ammo and consumables. The Lodge barely provides enough healing items as is, so if you're not perfecting encounters, you will run into a brick wall. These would be the gangster and the final boss, as either or require either gun to take care of because they will not give you a chance to get up close. You might be dead before you even get off the first shot, depending on your health management, as there are only three heals in the Lodge. 
the two sandwiches, and the gumball. That's it. Mess up too many times and you're reloading a save. Ammo is stringent to the same rules, but it's much worse. I don't know if this is localized to the Steam version or if this glitch affects all versions, but I couldn't reload during my trip through the final areas. I had extra shells for my shotgun, yet couldn't use them, effectively making both the gangster and final boss impossible to beat. Luckily, Harvest does have built-in cheats for ammo, but that just aggravates me for having to use them, like even if I played perfectly, I still wouldn't have any ammo for the shotgun or nail gun boning me out of those two fights that require them. Another issue with the game is its tendency to be unstable. Music tracks loop in odd ways and some cutscenes don't play. As mentioned, there's a hidden game over where you enter father's room at night where Steve's mom kills him with a shotgun, but that doesn't play. Again, I don't know if this is a known issue of all versions or only the Steam release, but it's not the only cutscene affected. Rounding out this section, there's some slight pixel hunting for certain area, for certain, for certain, uh, uh, items. Items, even though I probably already used items a lot in this freaking script because there's no other good word and this isn't creative writing, so my brain just shuts down. It's weird, when I'm doing creative writing, my brain's just like, oh yeah, all the good metaphors. But when I'm doing script writing, I'm just like, eh, ah, fucking just throw it together. <laughs> Rounding out this section, there's some slight pixel hunting for certain items, and the controls can be a tad jittery at times. The shovel is right on top of the mound of dirt signposting that you need to use it there, but with my poor eyesight, I completely missed it until I gave a closer look. Next to that is the key in the fountain, which is way worse than the shovel. Let me pull it up for you right now. Can you... can you see it? Can you? Point with your cursor or finger to where the key is. Those who have chosen above Steve's right shoulder, correct. Everyone else, well, we just found out who has 2020 eyesight, cheated, or played the game before, so don't feel too bad. Lastly, using the inventory can sometimes be a pain if there are foreground objects or if Steve is too close to exiting the screen. I lost one of the wood panels that way and found out saving in the pipe room will cause the game to crash when loading from there. While my trip to Harvest wasn't without issues, as the later half of the game being stuffed to the gills with lackluster combat does put a damper on the whole entire experience, the front half's bleak quirkiness outshines the weaker parts. The bad also doesn't overstay its welcome, letting the good outweigh it. Though the Steam version is fine enough outside of the ammo glitch that there's a workaround for, the GOG version supposedly doesn't have that problem. <coughs> What a way to start the year. Funny thing is, this video was completed before the new year even arrived. Now you know why the thumbnail has a holiday twinge to it. Harvester is definitely a short game, but it does have a lasting appeal. Ah, but with me tagging Bloodborne as the season finale for 2021, it would have been a bit off to release this. Timing is still not my specialty, just in reverse. This showing of Harvester is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving a cast of undersea characters characters, an army of robots, and a revamped graphical engine.